how awesome would it be to be in the right asset class for the right economic condition? I'm going to show you a simple quantitative and tactical strategy applied to the permanent portfolio that really improves its returns. Now, just to do a quick refresher and make sure we are all on the same page when it comes to the permanent portfolio, the permanent portfolio is comprised of four asset classes, each of which is intended to perform well in a specific economic climate proposed by the creator, Harry Brown. Those economic climates and corresponding asset classes I have listed out right here, they are economic expansion during that economic climate. U.S. stocks do quite well. Uh, during economic recessions, cash is generally the best asset class to hold. For inflation, there is gold. And deflation, there's bonds, specifically long-term treasuries. And the permanent portfolio holds each one of these at equal weight. So 25, 25, 25, 25%. Total, add it all up, that equals 100%. That is the permanent portfolio. And if we back test this going back to 1978, which I can easily do in this tool right here, uh, we can see how the permanent portfolio has performed. It has returned or grown at a compound annual growth rate of 8.58% annually. So on a total return basis, a $10,000 investment in this portfolio in January of 1978, that $10,000 investment would have grown to $379,000 today. And it did this with standard deviation of only 7.44%, that's relatively low, and a max drawdown, so highest point to lowest point drawdown of 13.38%. That is also relatively low. This portfolio is particularly appealing because of those relatively minimal downside elements or aspects of the portfolio, right? So if we put the S&P 500 on here, uh, let's just put the S&P 500 on here and look at this through the lost decade of the 2000s. Uh, it really stands out, you know, just how minimal downside this portfolio had. So we'll put it from 2000 to 2009. We'll have the S&P 500 on there as a benchmark. We can see the permanent portfolio here is the blue line. That went up, a $10,000 investment in it on a total return basis, so that means that we are reinvesting any capital gains and distributions, would have grown to $20,083 at an annual growth rate of 7.22%, whereas if you put $10,000 in the S&P 500, you would have had the dot-com bubble, uh, then the great financial crisis, and finished the decade about 10% lower than where you started. $10,000 would have went down to $9,000. So, you know, when you look at it in this context, in this little short time frame, and I have to stress, this is this is a relatively short time frame, only 10 years, that is considered a short time frame, the permanent portfolio did quite well. Now, if we expand it and look at, you know, the permanent portfolio compared to the S&P 500 over a long period of time, we, we, we will see that even though stocks, and stocks being the S&P 500, uh, what I'm using as a proxy for stocks, or using to represent stocks, or using to discuss stocks in this conversation here, they really outperform the permanent portfolio. $10,000 invested in the S&P 500 over this time would have became 1.4 million versus 10,000 in the permanent portfolio only became 379,000. But uh, stocks had a big drawdown there during the 2000s of almost 51%. All right. So now that we kind of have the basics and the primer out of the way, let's get to tactical strategy that we can use, quantitative tactical strategy. Everything I do is quantitative. Uh, I don't like any type of qualitative or like news-based, you know, strategies. I, I'm purely a quantitative dude. Uh, I'm purely a quantitative dude. That kind of sounds funny. Anyways, purely quantitative. So let's just take the S&P 500 off of here. We'll just take that off of here. And then we'll go back to this little listicle that I had of the economic climates and asset classes. In a perfect world, how awesome would it be to be in the right asset class for the right economic condition? Okay, so when the permanent portfolio is holding each one of these in static, right, it's holding 25% in cash for an economic recession. But most of the time, we are not in an economic recession. I think it is 7 out of 10 years. Um, in 7 out of 10 years, the S&P 500 is positive. Generally speaking, we are in an economic expansion far more than we are in economic recession. But that said, the portfolio gives the same weight to the asset class for economic expansion as it does economic recession. Same thing with inflation and deflation. We are generally inflating more than we are deflating. But by the same token, by the same token, 
bonds can go up during inflation and they can go up more than gold does, right? So wouldn't the ideal portfolio be to be in, you know, the right asset class for the right economic climate? Now, here's the thing. We usually don't know what the economic climate is until we are in it, right? Until we are a few months into it. So what I would propose doing is looking at these on a momentum basis. We can use intermediate term momentum, basically how well is this asset class done over a intermediate term period in investing in the best one or two performing asset classes. So uh, more specifically, I would look at six month time horizon, right? So if we go, you know, we look at these asset classes over the last six months, which one has done the best? Invest in the best performer. All right, well, that's what I've done here. Uh, let's just go over to this tab where I've kind of already got it pulled up. And I have got the asset classes represented using uh, either mutual funds or ETFs here. VFI and X is Vanguard's S&P 500 mutual fund. So there's our stocks. VUSTX is Vanguard's long-term treasury fund. GLD is a gold ETF and SHY uh, is short-term treasuries. That is representing cash. Fundamentally, short-term treasuries is a cash equivalent. I, I'm not, no, I was going to get into like the technical details of why that is the case and talk about the volatility properties. But anyways, uh, short-term treasuries are a cash equivalent. All right, so we've got the four asset classes there. We'll set a timing period of six months and look at what happens if we invest in the top performing asset class of the last six months. Okay, so here we go. We run the analysis and we can see the blue line. And the blue line is the momentum strategy here, the quantitative momentum strategy, because you would simply look at this, say, hey, what's performed over the last six months? Invest in that one, purely quantitative, purely rules-based. Here's what happens, all right? So the momentum model gets an 8.9 per 6% CAGR, or it has an 8.9 per 6 CAGR. It doesn't get it, it has that. Uh, equal weighting, which would effectively be the permanent portfolio because equal weighting would be 25% in each one of these four asset classes. So the permanent portfolio returned 7.02% annually. Uh, the momentum model had a lot higher standard deviation, so it's a lot more volatile and it did have more downside during this time period. And this is 06 to 2022. This is limited probably based on, probably based on gold. It should say that. Does it say it? No, it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't specifically say it, but I think that of all of these funds that we've got in here, it's, well, it might be SHY, might be short-term treasuries. Actually, we could replace this with VFISX, which is also which is a Vanguard short-term treasury mutual fund. Let's just see if that takes us back. No, it doesn't take us back any further. So uh, the limiting factor here is our data for gold by GLD. But during this time period, these are the metrics, okay? So what if we broadened this up here and said, let's just hold the top two. So at any one time or at any time, we will be in two of these asset classes, but not all of them. If things are just rip roaring up, we'll have 25% in stocks and 25% in gold or bonds, whichever one is going up as well. Or excuse me, we'll have 50% in stocks and 50% in gold or bonds. So so set that to two. Now we can see some real value here. Check this out. The compound annual growth rate goes up to 10.6%. So it's basically three and a half percent higher than a static buy and hold permanent portfolio. And the max drawdown is only 9.6%. So we get better returns in minimal or less drawdown. I shouldn't say minimal drawdown because the permanent portfolio is really a minimal drawdown portfolio, at least it has been historically, that is, you know, subject to change. There's no rule that says gold couldn't have a 90% drawdown. It's unlikely statistically, but it could happen. Uh, anyways, in doing this, we improve the compound annual growth rate and bring the drawdown down a little bit, or we lower the drawdown even further. So a $10,000 investment using this quantitative momentum tactical strategy here would have grown to $50,982 Whereas just the permanent portfolio, buy and hold, uh, would have only grown to $30,297. So there's a lot of value here in the simple quantitative tactical strategy. And well, quite frankly, I really like it. I really like simple quantitative strategies because as I kind of already called out, you're holding these allocations static, but most of the time, 70% of the time, you are in an economic expansion. 
30% of the time, roughly, and I mean, I guess this is anecdotally, I don't have any hard numbers on this uh, off the top of my head, you were in economic recession. So interestingly, you know, what would happen if we held 70% stocks and 30% cash during this time period? That'll be an interesting one to, that'll be an interesting one to hold. We can come back here. We will go 2006 and we will go 70% U.S. stocks. 30% short treasuries. All right, so during this time period, even if we just said, hey, we're going to you know, do this based on the time, uh, the time in each one of these economic climates, and I'm excluding inflation and deflation, we still only would have got a 7.17% return during this time period. Whereas, you know, using the momentum model here, taking a quantitative tactical approach, we would have had a 10.60% return. So yeah, the quantitative tactical strategy really adds some value to the permanent portfolio. Uh, and this is an example of a simple quantitative tactical strategy that I really, really like because I think that there's a lot of value if you can get into the right asset classes at the right time. Now, I got to point out because I know somebody's going to drop this in the comments. You know, you can't time the markets, yada, yada, yada. We are not timing the markets. We are simply reacting to the trend in the markets. We are not getting into an asset class when it's at the bottom and we're not getting out of it when it's into the top in at the top. We are simply looking at what has gone up, uh, you know, and academically speaking, there's a there's a phenomenon known as momentum and things that have gone up over a period of time or over an intermediate period of time tend to keep going up. So, you know, you might ask, you know, the next question I might get or the next comment that might come from people that are skeptical as well you know, you use six months. What if you use something different? Well, there is a broad parameter of stability here. Uh, if we go three months, right, it's not going to be exactly the same. It's a little bit worse, but it's still better than equal weighting. If we go to 12 months, it'll probably, probably do somewhere around the same. What happens at 12 months? Oops. Three, oh. Change the wrong button. Uh, assets to hold was two. 12 months is what we're going to do. And here it well, it actually performed a little bit worse, but about about the same, but a little bit worse, you know. So, yeah, uh, there is a broad parameter of stability, but again, there's no guarantee that it's going to do well. It seems like this one does well with a shorter time horizon, and I'm going to take a guess and say that's because all of these are very very uncorrelated asset classes. So before I wind it down, there's two other things I wanted to touch on. The first one is using leveraged ETFs in this strategy. As we know by now, there's four asset classes that the permanent portfolio holds. We can get all of them in a leveraged ETF with the exception of short-term treasuries. There's really nothing there to effectively lever. But there is a 2X gold ETF, there's a 2X S&P 500 ETF, and there's a 2X long-term treasury ETF. There is also 3X ETFs, but not for gold. So you can get a 3X long-term treasury a 3x S&P 500, but there is not currently a 3x gold ETF. There used to be a 3x gold ETF. Uh, I do not know the details on what happened to it, but I do know, do know it does not exist now. So we can do this with double leverage. All right. So let's take a look at what that looks like here using this tool. And I have gone ahead and put in SHY. That's the short term treasuries, which there is no substitute uh, or there is no leveraged ETF to substitute in there because there really isn't one that exists because you really fundamentally can't or really don't get any value out of leveraging a cash equivalent. Uh, then we have SSO, which is S&P 500, 2X UBT, 2X long treasuries, UGL, 2X long gold. And we can put it in here and we can run the analysis. We can see it goes back to January 2011. That was probably when, it's probably when about all of these ETFs were launched. So let's just toggle this, the non-leverage strategy back to 2011 so we can get a benchmark. And we can see during this time period, Jan 2011 to Feb 2022, there was an annual growth rate in the quantitative momentum strategy of 8.9% and a max drawdown of 9.72%. We'll probably see that the annual growth rate does not quite double with the leverage strategy and the max drawdown goes down a little bit more than double. And that's just characteristic 
of the daily reset that these levered ETFs use. They reset their futures contracts daily uh, to avoid basically an all-out loss or at least nearly eliminate the potential, the statistical risk of an all-out loss. They reset daily. So you do get what's called decay in there, and that's caused by the ETFs resetting daily. Uh, and in that case, it usually means that you don't get quite double or quite the you know X exposure in return and you get a little bit more in the drawdown. So if we look at this, 8.9 and 9.72, uh, yeah, we can see we get a 14.35% annual growth rate by double leveraging it, a little less than double, uh, and then a 23.84% drawdown. So a little bit more than double, uh, double using the leverage. But still, I think this is pretty good in terms of risk characteristics. There's a 0 .81, 0 0.81 sharp ratio, that's pretty good. And it still, you know, outperforms the equal weight. This is looking at the equal weight of the leveraged ETF. So, you know, the momentum model still holds up here and it still gets quite a bit of, you know, return premium above the momentum model non-levered. That's pretty cool. The only thing where I really see a problem here is like in periods like this from 2018 to the end of 2019, the momentum model was in a drawdown. Right? There's really no momentum happening here. So with any quantitative strategy or any strategy really that deviates from market cap weighting, your portfolio can be doing weird things. When the market cap is going up, your strategy can be going down. You have to have a you know a real strong conviction to your strategy to stick through it, stick to it through these times. And that is a challenge for a lot of investors. And I am no exception to that, even as I spend a ton of time researching and developing these types of quantitative strategies. This, you know, even though it's only a 24% drawdown right here, I know this would be very, very painful when people are sitting here, you know, in the buy and hold, that's going up and the S&P 500 is going up and you're drawing down, waiting for your time to shine. All right, so that was the first thing, uh, using leverage in this strategy. The other thing is taxes, okay? If you just buy and hold, you really aren't gonna pay much in taxes. You're not gonna realize capital gains. Any of these strategies, levered or non-levered, you're gonna have to pay a lot of short-term capital gains. Most of your gains, most of your compound annual growth rate will be in short-term capital gains. So if you're at the highest tax bracket, up near 40%, well, you need to take a 40% uh, haircut on your annual returns, and that is a fucking lot. Like, you know, reducing this by 40%, my gosh, I don't even want to think about that. That's going to take this thing from 7%, your, what would your annual growth rate be? Your annual growth rate would be like 8.25% if you give this a 40% haircut. That, that is painful. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. You know, if you're in a lower tax bracket, it doesn't really fundamentally matter or it won't matter as much you'll still pay more taxes than you would if you were, you know, holding the static portfolio. The other option is, is, you know, you move to Puerto Rico and sign up for the Act 20 and Act 22 and Act 60 and all that stuff and pay no capital gains tax. Uh, you know, that works. But taxes are something that you really need to consider whenever you're doing an active strategy. You know, I, I like I like active strategies, but I always consider taxes into my model when I'm doing them. So don't just look at this and say, oh, wow, you know, this thing prints money. It gets a high annual growth rate, minimal drawdown. You know what? I'm levering up and going into this quantitative momentum uh, permanent portfolio strategy. Well, you know, you are you are going to have to pay quite a bit on quite a bit in taxes on it. So, guys, I think that is all I've got for you on this strategy. So I'm going to call it a wrap on that. If you feel like there's any details that I missed out, certainly let me know in the comments below. I'm signing off on this one, guys.